welcome back everybody. I want to give a particular shout out to people who are watching us uh, on the web. And we've got quite an audience. Um, everything from people who are local here in Massachusetts to, let me, let me read some of them, uh, Corpus Christi, Texas, Norman, Oklahoma, Oklahoma. And we've also got international viewers in Lima, in Rio, Geneva, Montreal, Corfu, Greece, Karataro, Mexico, Zagreb, Croatia, and Ulaanbaatar, Mongolia. So welcome to all of you. Our next speaker is Kevin Esfeldt, who's an assistant professor of the M MIT Media Lab, where he leads the Sculpting Evolution Group in exploring evolutionary and ecological engineering. He helped pioneer the development of CRISPR, which you may know as a powerful new method of genome engineering. In 2013, he was the first to identify the potential for CRISPR gene drive, which you'll learn about, to alter wild populations of organisms. With the island communities of Nantucket and Martha's Vineyard, they're advancing the Mice Against Ticks project, which aims to prevent tick-borne disease, such as Lyme. An outspoken advocate of freely sharing research plans to accelerate discovery and improve safety, Dr. Esvelt seeks to use gene drive as a catalyst to reform the scientific ecosystem. But please join me in welcome, welcoming Kevin Esvelt. All right, thank you so much for the kind introduction and the invitation to speak today. So how many of you here today have been bitten by a tick? Please raise your hand. Yeah. See, I'm from the West Coast, so I find this horrifying. I mean, <laughs> if in Washington State, you know, you wander around in the forest all day and you never get bitten by a tick. There won't be any attached to your clothing. I, in fact, I never saw one growing up there. And so you come out here and it's just walk, take a walk in the woods and they're crawling and you, ugh. But that, is bad enough, of course. I mean, and there are mosquitoes everywhere, but with ticks, of course, they can give you disease. Now, mosquitoes can too, but here in the United States, at least, tick-borne disease is actually the number one vector-borne disease. Specifically, it's Lyme disease. Please raise your hand if you had Lyme. Yeah, quite a few, too many. So tick-borne disease is a problem that we have, to some extent, brought on ourselves. The CDC now estimates that there's upwards of 300,000 cases in the United States a year. And when I say we've brought it on ourselves, it's because we have engineered the local environment to maximize the incidence of tick-borne disease. How have we done that? Well, we love forests. We like trees, so we plant trees. And in fact, around here, it's actually more forested than it's been in a long time. But we also build roads and houses, of course, so we can get around in our lovely forests. And that means we've maximized the forest perimeter. And forest perimeter favors deer and white-footed mice. Now, every deer, every adult deer, has typically two to 5,000 ticks attached to it. And every adult female tick will lay a couple of thousand eggs. So every deer is a million ticks in the next generation. So we've maximized the number of deer. The only effective predator these days is the automobile. And that means we've maximized the number of ticks. But even worse, ticks bite three times, and usually it's small mammal, small mammal deer. Now, of the small mammals, the white-footed mouse is the best reservoir for every form of tick-borne disease. That is, tick bites a mouse. If the tick's infected, the mouse pretty much always gets infected if it's a white-footed mouse. That's not true for the other things that ticks might bite. And the same is true when an infected mouse gets bitten by an uninfected tick. Tick pretty much always gets infected with the pathogen that causes Lyme. So we have maximized the number of mice and the number of ticks, and therefore the number of infected ticks, and this is a problem that we created. That's why 100 years ago, you, people really hadn't heard of tick-borne disease. It's not because it wasn't there, it was just very rare. So this is why we have a problem. It's not just Lyme disease, of course. Borrelia burgdorferi is, is the cause of Lyme disease. There are other forms of Borrelia. There's also Babesia and Anaplasma and Ehrlichia, and there's even a couple of viruses, namely Powassan, which is truly terrifying. But they're all passed between white-footed mice and the black-legged ticks. It's an ecological cycle, back and forth between the two, and we would not care, except for the fact that an infected tick can, of course, bite us, and give us disease, and our pets' disease. Incidentally, 
our pets have a vaccine and we don't. <laughs> How fair is that? It used to be on the market for humans, but it was withdrawn at the very beginning of the vaccine scare. And now there is no vaccine for humans for Lyme disease, and there was never one, and there is not one in development for any of the others. And the incidence of all of them, of course, is rising. And the others are actually more dangerous than Lyme disease for the most part. So we have this simple idea of what would happen if we built a shield around the mice? What if the mice could not become infected? Well, you would disrupt this ecological cycle of transmission, and you'd have fewer ticks, fewer infected ticks, and fewer cases of human disease. Probably, given the importance of the mice, a lot fewer. This is the premise behind mice against ticks. We want to enlist the mice to fight ticks and tick-borne disease. So, it says here it's a community effort to prevent tick-borne disease. And this is based around a simple question. How do you engineer a wild population of white-footed mice? There's a lot of mice in the woods. How are you going to immunize them? You're going to catch them one by one and jab them with a needle? This is clearly not going to fly. You need something else. We need to actually engineer their DNA so that they are immune and can pass that immunity on to future generations of mice because we don't want to release hundreds of thousands or millions of mice in the woods every season because they have five or so generations a year. The solution is you look at an island because there's probably a billion mice on the mainland, but on, say, Martha's Vineyard, there's maybe 100,000 at most in the spring at the end of winter. There's maybe 800,000 at the beginning of winter. That's how much it fluctuates. So if you introduced, say, 100,000 mice in the spring, then you'd be introducing as many mice as are there. And if these introduced mice had resistance genes, then they would pass them down to future generations, and most future mice would inherit one. And because it's an island, you don't have this constant influx and interbreeding of, of wild mice. And the same goes for Nantucket. But, of course, if you're proposing to do anything like this, not only are you proposing to genetically engineer a wild population, which is, I understand, a little bit controversial, <laughs> but you really are doing a different kind of research than pretty much anything else, with the arguable exception of public health. Just because you're changing the shared environment, that is, your research is intended to affect everyone. So please raise your hand if you don't have a smartphone. Yes, there are a few people. It is possible to live without a smartphone. <laughs> you can opt out of having a smartphone, but you cannot opt out of breathing the air or drinking the water, consuming the fruit of the land. And this is why people are sensitive about these things. Because if you are proposing to develop a technology intended to alter that, it will necessarily affect everyone, and they cannot opt out. And that means if you do this work behind closed doors, as virtually all science is done, then you are denying them a voice in decisions that will affect them. We have fought long and hard for some form of representation in government, and yet now, because technology is allowing us to do things like this, Scientists are undertaking projects that will affect people as much as legislation passed by duly elected representatives. And they're doing it in secret where the people cannot possibly have a voice in those decisions. So we decided, okay, if we're even going to consider this, we need to do it differently. We need to not only cherry pick our problems, which is one reason why we're looking at tick-borne disease. You want to address something that people care about and it's obviously an issue to everyone but you want to share your proposals before you do anything in the lab. Before you do anything at all, you want to go to the communities and say, all right, we think this is a problem, but you're the ones who live here. Do you think it's a problem? And here are the different ways that we think we might be able to address it. Ideally, lay out several of them and say, what do you think of these? We want to hear from everyone, including vocal skeptics. I love vocal skeptics. 
because they're not afraid to stand up and tell me, that is a terrible idea. And as long as they're willing to say why that's a terrible idea, that's fantastic, because there's always a chance, often a good chance, that they may have thought of something that none of us has. And that means that we have a chance of fixing it before we actually do it. In fact, before we even develop anything. You don't want the public comment period to be at the end of the technology development cycle. You want it at the very, very beginning so you can address things from the get-go. So you not only want to invite concerns, you want to invite community guidance. And in fact, we decided to go further than this. We decided that the communities, it's their environment, they need to be in control. They need to govern the project. They need to have the pow power to say no at any point, and then we walk away. That is, we are just the technical hands. They are in the driver's seat. And by the way, we can be the technical hands, but we can't be the technical assessors, because we're biased. Right? Who's the last person you want to test the scientific hypothesis? It's the person who proposed it. They're the single most biased individual in the entire world. Why do we do science the way we do again? Oh, right, apparently no one thought that one through. But the same is true of technology. You don't want me to evaluate whether this is a good idea, looking at the field trial data and so on, because I cannot help but be biased. I am human. This is how we are built. You need independent assessors to take a look at this. And so this is what we're going to have to have. The communities are going to contract with an independent group, maybe the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, down the road, maybe the national academies, to essentially appoint a group of independent researchers to evaluate this step by step and give the report to the communities, who then will eventually vote on whether or not to move forwards. So how would it work? Well, if you take mice, we can immunize them against various things, using vaccines just by exposing them to ticks, a bunch of different ways of doing it. And if you do this to a bunch of mice, then you will get mice, some mice, that are resistant to whatever you expose them to. Their immune systems will evolve and produce antibodies that, are, that can bind and are protective against whatever we expose them to. We can then do B cell sorting. There's a few other methods too, but this is the one we settled on, to identify antibody encoding genes produced by those individual resistant mice. We can then make those antibodies in the lab and test them, both in the dish and in the animals, verify that they actually are protective against what we want, and then we can encode them. This is the neat trick. We can encode those genes taken from some mice into the germline genome, that is, the cells that will lead to sperm and egg production, so that those genes taken from a few mice will be passed on to future generations. This is not something that our immune systems normally do. That is, we get a cold. Sadly, our kids are not immune to every cold we've ever gotten. That would be lovely, but that's not how it works. But in the lab, now that we have tools like CRISPR, we can actually do that. So we can make mice that are born secreting protective antibodies. We're looking at doing it from the liver, because the liver secretes all sorts of stuff in your bloodstream. So they just have these extra copies of antibody encoding genes that the liver would secrete from birth, providing resistance. And then, once you have these mice, and they look resistant to whatever we're immunizing them against in the lab, and that it's heritable, then you need to test it. And that involves a field trial on a small, probably mostly uninhabited island off the coast somewhere. And then you have the assessment over a couple of years, look at everything people think of that they're afraid might go wrong in the ecosystem, and a few things that they haven't. And the independent assessor team delivers a report. And on the basis of that, the communities vote. Good old New England town hall democracy style. Propose a warrant at the town meeting, and they vote. And on the vineyard, of course, because mice will move all over the island, presumably all six towns have to vote yes. Nantucket, just, it would be just the one vote. And then that would involve releasing hundreds of thousands of potentially of genetically engineered mice on Nantucket and the vineyard. Bet none of you ever thought you might see that. But there are rules when you are working with biology. Because evolution likes complexity. If you make sure that things connect to lots of other different things, then you're very evolvable. A lot of potential mutations can change things and then be adaptive. And so that's why evolution seems to like this. 
but it makes it bloody difficult to engineer because you tweak one thing and it changes a bunch of other things. And if this is true within an organism, within a cell, how much worse is it in an ecosystem? So the general rule is be humble, but that's not a very useful rule. We need to be more specific than that. So I have, you should try to make the smallest possible change that can solve whatever problem you're interested in. And you need to start local and small, small scale, see if it works, and only then scale up if warranted. And so that's, this is why we do field trials. Now, what is the problem in this case? What are we going to immunize the mice against? And here's where there's different options and different ways of going about it. Option number one is, say, Lyme disease is the most common problem. We can immunize them against the Lyme pathogen, just like the vaccine does. And they will generate antibodies. We can then make those heritable and protect all the mice against Lyme disease specifically, and therefore us. That would be minimally, that would be a minimal intervention, because we don't think Lyme disease does much, ecologically speaking. Wouldn't affect anything else. The other option is to immunize the mice against the ticks. That is, the tick has to suppress the mouse's immune system in order to remain attached to its host for our several days. If you immunize the organism against the tick's immunosuppressive proteins, which is sort of its invisibility shield. If you say to the immune system, hey, you might get, in by, get bitten by a tick, and if so, they have this neat in invisibility shield that they'll construct, but if you catch it early, here's what it looks like. And then the immune system attacks and destroys that key immunosuppressive protein, and then it can see the tick, and in what can only be described as a miracle, this molecular level immune response can somehow make the mouse taste bad. And so the tick will fall off. It's like, like it's bitten into some, I don't know, habanero sauce. <laughs> so we asked the communities what they wanted, and the pretty much universal answer, there were a ha bare handful of people, you know, in the couple of percent that said one or the other. But virtually everybody said, look, if you're going to do it at all, just do both. Throw the kitchen sink at them. Because people said, the problem is not just Lyme disease, it's all of the other diseases and option one wouldn't do anything for those. But above all else, we are sick of having so bloody many ticks in the woods. If you can reduce the number of ticks back to the way it was 50 years ago, that would be great. And so they want to do both. However, there's a caveat. No matter how much you tell people that, you know, raise your hand if you ate beef in the last week. Please, everyone. Did you know that the cow genome is 25% snake? It's true. Gene transfer event, probably tick-mediated, about a million or so years ago, spread a virus that included a jumping gene from snakes that then replicated in the auroch genome and was inherited by cows. So cows are 25% snake. Genes move between species all the time. Species is an arbitrary concept. But that doesn't matter because people are leery of moving DNA between species. And it's their environment, so, it's, so they're in control. So they said, don't use any foreign DNA, which we can still do, remember, because that mouse adaptive immune response produces resistant antibodies in the mice. So now these pro the project is run by a steering committee, one for each island, appointed by the boards of health. And in the lab, we have now have anti-Lyme antibodies from white-footed mice. And we've immunized mice against the tick protein. And next, we need to verify that all of these antibodies work in the tests, develop genome editing, because no one's done that in white-footed mice. The steering committees, on behalf of the islands, are going to apply for regulatory approval for field trials, which is going to be a novel approach. It's not going to be the scientists. It's going to be the communities. And hopefully, we will identify suitable small islands for trials. There's a bunch of candidates, and, and people are very interested in that. So the, to be clear, though, this is many years away. The earliest possible release on Nantucket or the Vineyard would be 2024. But that doesn't help most of you. Some of you may well live on Nantucket and the Vineyard. I don't know, but probably most of you don't, even if you may visit there. So how do you alter a population of mainland mice? There's like a billion of them, right? They're just not going to rear that many. You've got to spread those antibody genes somehow. And here is where gene drive comes in. So CRISPR is a molecular scalpel that we can use to cut and therefore edit pretty much any gene in any organism where we can get the DNA in. So you introduce CRISPR, but 
you actually encode the CRISPR system for doing genome editing into the genome itself, along with, in this case, the antibodies. So then CRISPR cuts the target, copies itself in. You now have a resistant mouse, but you also have a mouse that knows how to make the CRISPR system, and so it will cut the other chromosome, copy itself over. So now this mouse has two copies, which means that when it mates, all of its offspring are going to inherit. And in those offspring, genome editing is going to happen again. It's going to cut the wild type version inherited from the other parent, and it's going to copy itself over. Meaning, when those mice mate, the next generation, everybody's going to inherit, and the next, and the next, and the next. So we pointed out that this could be done with CRISPR, I guess three years ago now, publicly. And it was pretty obvious that this could save millions of lives because tick-borne disease is one thing, it's what we care about here, but obviously we've heard about much more terrible epidemics, and the most obvious one is malaria. So in the time that I've been speaking, malaria has killed probably 10 children and infected 5,000 people. So conceivably, one could use this to immunize all of the malarial, the major ma malaria vectors, particularly in Africa. That raises a lot of moral issues. But it's not just malaria. Schistosomiasis has also in has infected even more people, possibly six to 7,000 people, and has killed somewhere between two and five, probably. We're not quite sure. This is true even though you have praziquantel, which is a perfect cure that costs pennies. The problem is this bad, even though we have a perfect cure that costs pennies because people just get reinfected. But with a gene drive, we could potentially target and eliminate the schistosomes responsible directly. But nothing is ever easy. Again, should we be doing this in secret? This is way worse than just making resistant mice where you have to release hundreds of thousands of them. This is something where you release a few and it affects an entire wild population. Should we be doing this in secret? I mean, we thought no. So we pretty much flew in the face of scientific tradition and said, hey, we've been working with CRISPR for a while. We know this is going to work. It's the same mechanism. Here's how it could work, and we think we should tell people before we actually try it in the lab. So that's what we did. And since then, we have been pre-registering all of our experiments. That is, we detail what we're going to do and why and what safeguards we're using in advance so that people have time to comment before we actually do them. And this approach strikes people as reasonable. I have yet to encounter anyone who says, oh, no, that's a horrible idea. You shouldn't do that. And the National Academies had a report on gene drive that said, agreed that the best course of action is to ensure that those who would be affected have an opportunity to have a voice, of course. And yet somehow they didn't quite draw the, you know, connect the dots to this means that research needs to be done in the open so that people can have a voice. Because that would be inconvenient, you see. That would require researchers to do something different. That would require you to share your brilliant idea with everybody else and thereby run the risk that someone else might publish it first and harm your career. Never mind, are people likely to trust us to even develop this technology and potentially use it if we're doing it in secret because we're concerned for our careers? Color me a little bit skeptical. And despite the fact that everybody publicly agrees that this is probably what we should do, it's one of those cases where nobody actually does anything to support this. They just all voice support and then hope that maybe somebody else will do something. And even the scientists would love to have it live in a different world where we weren't punished for sharing what we're doing. But systems are hard to change. So we're trying. There's four main levers over scientific practices, IP, journals, funders, and, and policymakers. Problem is journals, funders, and policymakers are all collective action problems. Nobody wants to do anything unless everybody else does too at the same time. So I'm interested in this concept of ethical licensing. And this will only happen if the universities are brave, specifically your local universities. So if you have ties to Harvard or MIT, guess who has a lot of patents involving CRISPR and CRISPR gene drive? So we're talking to them and, and to the Broad, for example, and Berkeley about can we perhaps use those to say, we'll give anybody who wants it in a research license to use these technologies to develop gene drive systems, 
for free, but only if you pre-register, only if the work is done in the open. That's, that's the requirement. That's the idea, hopefully it'll work. But people often ask me, well, why do you care? Now, there's a great webcomic written by a guy from Somerville, Randall Monroe, called XKCD. And this came out last week. And it pretty much explains very well why I, in particular, care. So this plots different fields of research by the risk that your research will be used by a supervillain for world domination, <laughs> by the risk of the thing you're studying breaking free from your facility and threatening the local population. And my laboratory works in the areas up here. So this is why I'm concerned. And I think we can all agree that if genetic engineering is there on the plot, gene drive is somewhere up and to the right. So that's what I do. This is why I'm concerned. But more generally, I have to say I think the world would be a better place if all researchers, if we all held ourselves morally responsible for all the consequences of our work, all of it, intended and unintended. And we can't anticipate everything, so we should be inviting everyone to tell us how we might be wrong. Because science doesn't work by some magic method. Science works by setting up the incentives for other people to prove us wrong. And that should not be limited to professional scientists. The real problems, though, are invasiveness and trust. If you, we've done some simulations led by Chuck Noble. If you introduce a gene drive into one population that's connected to others, it takes a very, very low migration rate for it to spread. And this is driven home by, if you simulate the worst gene drive system published to date, if you introduce a handful of organisms into a population, a few dozen, say, fruit flies, that carry this worst possible gene drive described to date, it takes off in a new population. So, first of all, if this thing gets out, laboratory accident starts turning an entire species around the world into GMOs, you think people are going to support using this against malaria? Are Africans really going to vote in favor of that if we accidentally edit all the fruit flies, say? So we tried to prevent this. Um, unfortunately, no matter how much publicity you get, there's always some scientists who don't see it. And we were very afraid that someone might independently decide, hey, wouldn't it be cool to insert CRISPR? into the genome because then we could knock out both copies at once. That'd be a great laboratory tool, right? And not even think about the possibility that it might spread in the wild. And sure enough, exactly that happened. They named it something horrific to, be, to boot. But um, we got together with them and a bunch of other people and agreed on necessary laboratory safeguards. And as best we can tell, theirs didn't get out. So I think we're OK. But the real problem is that there also means there is no such thing as a safe field trial. You cannot start local and scale up if warranted. You cannot know what the effect is going to be of your actual gene drive system of this kind. Because you try it anywhere, and the odds are it's going to spread to every population of that species in the world. And you can talk about your very isolated island hosting only a military installation all you want. But Australia was testing a rabbit hemorrhagic disease. And it got off of their island and spread in Australia. And then New Zealand said, no, we don't want that. You didn't study it well enough. And New Zealand farmers smuggled it in anyway through the tightest biosecurity in the world. If you think that people won't move organisms around the world, let's look at history. And of course, that also means that every nation har harboring the target species must agree in advance to do this. Now, there is a great organization, Target Malaria, led by Austin Burt who first proposed using gene drive to, car to, tar to combat malaria in particular. And they're doing their best. They're working with multiple African countries and scientists on the ground and, and trying to ensure that Africans can lead the development and testing of non-drive equivalents. But they need to get everybody to agree. And that's, that's a tough one. Might be possible for malaria almost certainly not for schistosomiasis unless malaria goes first. And for Aedes aegypti that spread dengue and Zika and chikungunya and yellow fever, forget about it. More than 100 countries harboring more than 4 billion people live with those mosquitoes, and they would all be affected. So no way. So what can you do? I'm running out of time, but we need to make a local drive system, one that does not spread forever. 
And since the problem is it has everything it needs, you need to split up those drive components so, it is, so that they are limiting. So the idea is you separate this into a, what we call a daisy chain drive because these different components are spread across different chromosomes and they're related to each other. So say C causes B to be copied. That is, B only drives in the presence of C. And A only drives in the presence of B. But C is a normal engineered gene. It's inherited normally. Which means if you have an organism that has two copies of C and B and A of the drive, and it mates, then since there's two copies of all of them, all the offspring inherit. But some of them only inherit one, but of course they only inherit one copy, and then C doesn't dr drive. So this organism doesn't have C. Note the daisy chain is shorter. And when it mates, some of its offspring no longer have B, which means in the next generation, you actually have descendants that don't inherit the primary change. So this means that it's, it's local. These, every daisy link in this chain is like a form of genetic fuel. They will run out over time, just due to normal inheritance, until it stops. And it's a built-in limit. There's only so many. And if you give them more, it will be more powerful. It will spread for longer before it stops. And that's useful because we don't want to have to release that many organisms. That's, that's costly, and we are resource limited. So if you have a 90% homing drive, which is on the low end for mosquitoes, most mosquito drives work better than this, then you'd have to release one per, one edited mosquito, say, per 50 wild ones within your town, which is not too bad. If you have 98% copying efficiency, which is on lines with the African malarial mosquito experiments to date, then it's one per 500, which is even better. But if what if, say, Cambridge wanted to do this and Somerville didn't in terms of immunizing mice now, I'm thinking, how do you deal with that? How do you teach the mice not to go across the line? <laughs> well, the answer is you, you teach the genes to vote. So specifically, you invoke natural selection to favor whichever is in the majority, either engineered or wild type. And we think we can do this in the context of a daisy drive by introducing this quorum effect. So the idea is you release your daisy drive organisms in the center of town, it spreads out to affect the local town population, and there it's in the majority. And so when the daisy elements run out, the quorum effect says, causes it to be selected for, against the wild type. But outside of town, engineered is in the minority, and so natural selection acts to eliminate them. So then selection will actually reinforce our arbitrary, invisible political boundaries, because they'll actually be reflected in the genetic frequency. This is super theoretical. It looks good in the models. It looks pretty good in some of the very preliminary experiments, but it's very theoretical. But this is our best attempt at getting this technology in a form where it might actually be useful without having to get everybody to agree in advance. And this is why I think it's important that we have projects like Mice Against Ticks, because the other problem is that public perception issue. On Nantucket and the Vineyard, a lot of people have PhDs. More importantly, that just means that pretty much everyone knows someone who they trust, who has enough technical expertise to assess what we're doing. It's much harder working with people who don't speak your language and don't have that kind of background. And especially when you have a legacy of things like colonialism. Overcoming that is difficult. So if the people who have the education and the power and the privilege are willing to use it and publicly support it and go first, then that, I think, is a more viable path forwards than going to where, frankly, it's needed most in terms of sheer human lives and suffering. So finally, thank you so much for the invitation, for the organizers, and especially to my group, because I'm at the MIT Media Lab. We're rewarded for being controversial and provocative and all that jazz. So I can come up here and bash the current way science is done and call for change, and that, that gets me bonus points. Doesn't matter how many scientists I offend. My tenure committee will love that. But my students really are putting their careers on the line by sharing their best ideas in the open and risking getting scooped and having those, their promising careers destroyed. So they are the real heroes here.
And so please give them a round of applause. So thank you for your attention. I'd be happy to take questions. Great, thank you. Wow, my head is spinning. This is, this is such brave work. Uh, thank you very much. So we are gonna take questions. Um, if you can uh, line up at the mic. Um, what I think we will do is take uh, a couple of questions, maybe two or three in a row, and let Kevin sort of put them together. And we've got about, I think still, uh, looks like about 12 minutes for questions. So uh, I'm sure we are full of them. Hi, my name is Ned Bacon, really enjoyed the talk. Can you just make a few brief remarks on progress on specificity and off-target edits with CRISPR? Thank you. My name is Marcy Wells, and the first thing that came to my mind is, why can't you give the ticks birth control? <laughs> Hi, my name is Taj Zarian, and uh, being in Massachusetts, we're at the home of compulsory immunizations founded in 1905 in Jacobson's versus Massachusetts. And I'm just wondering, with your nuanced approach to getting community buy-in, if we were able to go back in time and change the way that we approached immunizations and done it in a similar approach to what you're doing, do you think we'd have a higher or lower immunization rate today? <laughs> My name's Ethel Jackson, and I wonder if you could just give us a quick update on where things stand with release of uh, gene drive edited mosquitoes. Uh, uh, I, I know there, there's been a, a lot of uh, effort along those lines and just uh, like to know where that stands in terms of uh, environmental release. Okay, so initially off-target effects on CRISPR. So CRISPR is of course being looked at for all sorts of things. Its biggest impact is on research just because it makes everything that we do in the lab so much easier but it's also being looked at therapeutically for gene therapy and the like, and one obvious concern is you wanna program CRISPR to cut a particular gene and no other genes, because if you accidentally cut a tumor suppressor, that's bad. If you're doing gene therapy on a lot of cells and a lot of patients, you need to be sure that you're very, very accurate. So there's been a lot of research, particularly in, in the Boston area by groups working to make CRISPR even more specific. And the best versions now are the off-target rate is pretty close to undetectable, and that's great, but just because you can't detect it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And so if you were to roll out something to, say, 50 million people, and you're altering a billion cells per person, which is a tiny fraction of the cells in an individual's body, we can't test that many. So that's why CRISPR will be great for medical problems where you're willing to take a tiny risk of cancer in exchange for solving an actual problem, but it's not going to be useful for what one might call a recreational gene therapy. Tick birth control. Um, the preferred form of tick birth control is kill them. <laughs> so we have, lots of, we have lots of chemicals we use to kill ticks, and they're concentrated, of course, on deer. So you, there are these four poster devices where you feed the deer and it basically rubs uh, pesticides on the deer to kill the ticks on them. You, there are also these tubes where you have permethrin treated cotton balls in the tubes, you leave them out, the local mice grab them and use them for nesting material and then burrow into them and the permethrin kills all the ticks on them. Um, I'm not aware of anyone working on actual tick contraceptives. However, every couple of years, oh, every couple of months I get an email from someone in the world, usually from somewhere in the, local, in the United States, who says, why are you mucking around with mice? Just use a suppression gene drive. Standard version affects the entire species to eliminate all the ticks. Which, you might say, how can a gene drive do that? Well, there's a couple of different ways. The obvious one is, let, suppose you're, the gene you're transmitting turns them all into males. So, I'm skeptical that you can actually go all the way to extinction, certainly not with a single drive system due to likelihood of resistance, et cetera. But one could conceivably do that, except that the tick generation time is two years. So if you're willing to wait a century, we might be able to do that. On, let's see, next question was, was vaccines and immunization history. And if we have, I don't really know on that one. 
Uh, I know that genetic engineering in general, had we started with something that was actually a problem that's obvious to ordinary people as opposed to, or even played up that recombinant insulin is recombinant, <clears throat> that everyone, raise your hand if, you're, if you take insulin. Anyone? <clears throat> so that insulin, of course, comes from engineered microbes. It's recombinant DNA, it's genetic engineering, it's GMOs. But most people don't think of it that way. We think about genetic engineering in the context of Monsanto. And what do all those products do for the people who buy them in the market? A couple of cents cheaper? That's just not enough. So I, that one I know would be different, but vaccines, that was a long time ago. And it's hard to argue with government control and so I, I, I really don't know the answer to that one. I think that the more we invite people's voices, the better off we will be because things will be safer and I think more acceptable to people if people have a voice. But beyond that, I, I couldn't really say. And as for mosquito gene drive systems, <clears throat> there are a number of laboratories working on them. There may be some that I don't know of. The current status is that the things that you see that are published are not, um, most of the latest advances have not been published. And most of the work, in fact, everything other than our collaborators um, and my lab, collaborators particularly at Harvard and Flaminia Cataruccia and George Church's group in particular, and we're working with Paul Brindley at George Washington University on schistosomiasis, and um, with Purbright University, Luke Alfie um, in the UK, and University of Otago, Neil Gemmell in New Zealand on rats. Those are the only projects that are completely open. There's a bunch of mosquito ones. Um, target malaria has results showing that where they've solved the problem of the drive system acting after fertilization. And this is important if you're doing a, um, for the suppression drive that they're looking for to reduce the population, just because you need to ensure that your offspring inherit one functional copy of a gene that's important for fertility. So if you cut that copy just after fertilization, it doesn't work. And that's been the huge, it also reduces the efficiency of the drive system, and so that's been the number one hurdle. Um, that one, it seems to have been solved in the main malaria vector species in Ophelia's Gambier. Other problems include, to make it evolutionarily stable, you have to program CRISPR to cut many, many sites. Um, that problem is still being worked out. Um, it's one that we're working on. Once you solve that and put those two together, they have enough target genes that it should work. What I don't know, so I think the social side of will every African country be able to agree is gonna be the limiting factor. There are people working on that form of gene drive system in 80s Egypti. I think it's a terrible idea, but yeah. There's nothing I can do about that beyond urge them to be a little bit more open than what, than what they currently are. And see if we can maybe get the universities around here to agree to a patent pool for ethical licensing to ensure that that work and all other work is open. Join me in thanking Kevin.